Chapter 3 Serving and Grace Since works are necessary for salvation, would a person be saved by his works or by the grace of the Holy Spirit working in him? Many went far in defending either of them and were mistaken. So we shall try here to give an answer to such an important question, in other words, how is man saved? Is it by striving, by grace, or by both together? Striving and grace together. A person cannot be saved by his striving alone. For the Lord Jesus Christ, glory be to him, says, Without me, you can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. You cannot be saved then by your own human arm, power, alone, without God supporting you, whatever striving or labor you may have. But grace would not save you by itself unless your will responds to it. How beautiful the words of St. John Chrysostom in this regard are. He says, God does not want us to lie down on our backs and he gives us the kingdom. For grace does not do everything alone. Grace is not a cause for laziness, carelessness, and slackening. Do not say then in laziness without any striving in your life and unwisely say, I submit myself to grace to do whatever it wants for me. The work of grace within you, brother, does not mean that you sleep and slacken in performing your duties. The example of Joshua and Moses. Joshua the son of Nun led the army and fought Amalek, while Moses stood on top of the hill holding up his hands in prayer. Exodus chapter 17 verse 11. Do the people defeat Amalek through the fighting of Joshua's army or through the prayer of Moses? Concentrating on one of them and neglecting the other would be a mistake, because Joshua alone, however hard he fought, without the prayer of Moses, or in other words, without God's help, would have never defeated. However, the prayer of Moses did not mean at all encouraging the army to slacken before the enemy depending on that prayer. Fighting and prayer went together side by side. One was striving in the war and the other holding up his hands in prayer. Both were inseparable. The Communion of the Holy Spirit There is a beautiful verse which, if well understood, would make us understand more about grace and striving. It is the apostolic benediction which says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 It is a communion between two, working together, the Holy Spirit and man. The Holy Spirit is able to save and redeem you, but he would not do it alone. He wants you to participate with him in managing your own life. And this is the communion of the Holy Spirit. You may argue, saying, How is that? Is not the Holy Spirit alone able to save me? Nay, he is able, but he does not want. It is not God's dispensation to force you to do good, because you would not be rewarded for an action done without your discretion. Again, we say, if it is the Holy Spirit who works alone, why then are there righteous people and evil ones? If the matter is confined to the work of the Holy Spirit alone, there would be no single sinner on earth. The Holy Spirit can make a sinner repent, but he does not want to do so unless the sinner's will agrees with him. It is a communion. The mere existence of just one sinner in the world, not willing to repent, is a sure evidence that grace alone does not do everything. Does the work of grace mean the abolishing of personal freedom? No, for you still have your discretion and your will. You can respond to the work of the Holy Spirit within you, to participate in work with him and be led by him. But you can also stop the work of the Holy Spirit within you if you wish to. So the Holy Bible warns us, saying, Do not quench the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. And also, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Grace is standing knocking at the door. As the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 But what if he does not open? He has full discretion to determine his own destiny as he wishes. Grace offers you help, and you have the option to accept or refuse, to work or not. 
If you do participate with the Holy Spirit in action, for your own sake, you will, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, attain perfect holiness according to the extent of your response and submission. But if you refuse to participate, grace will never force you to do good. Many people go far in interpreting the word striving, as to consider it including a heresy, as if it were something against faith and against God's help. All this is wrong. Grace is just a weapon offered you. You have the option, either to fight with it and conquer, or neglect it and meet the adversary disarmed and be defeated. In both cases, you are free to carry out your own will, but it is for your own good to make use of the weapon offered you for your own salvation. Take as an example for this the soldier who receives from their leadership during war tanks, guns, bombs, and weapons to fight with. In case they conquer, is their victory due to their own bravery or the weapons? Their bravery alone without the weapons would not be sufficient at all to bring them victory because fighting needs weapons. Likewise, weapons alone without skilled soldiers to use them can do nothing. The same applies to spiritual wars in which man's will participates in work with the spiritual weapons. The Necessity of Striving Many indeed are the holy texts which confirm the necessity of striving. From among these texts we cite the words of the Apostle, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 then he rebukes the Hebrew, saying, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. It behooves us then to strive, not the ordinary striving, but striding to bloodshed against sin. Would anyone ask, until when? We say, until the end of one's life. As the Holy Bible says, he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. The apostle who strove much and spoke of striving explains to us how his life was supported by grace. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7-8 through 8. It is a striving, but not a personal one, separate from God's work. It is rather a combination of both matters. As the Apostle says about his preaching, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 It is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. Some people go far in talking about the role of grace as to belittle the role of striving. Depending on the verse which says, so then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Romans chapter 9 verse 16 What does this mean? Does it mean that God's mercy grants us free salvation and transfers us to the kingdom of heavens without any comfort or goodwill on our side? Does it mean that a person relaxes lazily and runs not towards good, nor even wishes it, depending on God's mercy, to have compassion upon him in spite of his slackness? This can never be the meaning. It is not impossible to say that the Apostle meant by his words, not of him who runs, which in another place he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. He who says, not of him who runs, he himself has finished the race and attained the crown of righteousness as a reward for his running and his good fight. The same person who said, not of him who runs, said also about himself, not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of, that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. Saint Paul himself pressed on that he might lay hold. Is this just a personal experience which Saint Paul had? Certainly not. 
It is for everyone. So St. Paul goes on saying, Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, perfect, have this mind. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. Then, if you are mature, perfect, you have to press on so that you may apprehend. St. Paul himself calls us all to this running and this striving. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 What is it that you should require us to do, great apostle? Why should we run since it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs? What is the use of running and striving then? Suffice us to stand still where we are and wait for God's grace to come and transfer us from death to life and bring us into the kingdom of heaven freely without our willing or running? But St. Paul proceeds saying, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Therefore I run thus, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25-27 through 27. This running and striving, then, is not only for us, the weak believers, but also for the apostles. As we see from the verses, St. Paul himself ran and pressed on, though he was filled with the Holy Spirit and grace worked in him more than in others. Yet he was in need to run, to pass on, to finish the race, and to fight the good fight. He calls us to do as he did in order that we may attain. This great saint disciplined his body and brought it into subjection in order not to become disqualified. If St. Paul himself strove and was afraid lest he should be refused, what ought we to do then? What then is the meaning of the words, It is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. The meaning is that you cannot attain the kingdom just by your willing or striving, without God's work within you, without the help of his grace, and without the communion of the Holy Spirit. The main action in this regard is by God who shows mercy. So whoever depends on his own will and his own striving is actually in the wrong way. But the right thing is that I press on, and God shows mercy. And when God blesses my labor, I ascribe the result to God, not to my own labor. It is true that it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. But towards whom does God show mercy? One of the saints said, God shows mercy towards them who will and who run. And this reminds me of another verse said by St. Paul also. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 True indeed, it is God who gives the increase. But to what? To the plant which is planted and watered. Then, we must not abstain from planting and watering, saying to ourselves that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, and wait foolishly for God to give the increase. The right thing is to plant and water, yet say that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It is the same as we said before, that we have to will and to run, yet say that it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. The Spiritual War Let us meditate on St. Paul's description of the spiritual war in his epistle to the Ephesians. He says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist in truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the swords of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. 
Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Here we find wrestling, spiritual fight, and striving, while the weapon is the whole armor of God. This does not mean that you do not strive, but you ought to strive, yet depend on God in your striving. Do not be like one given God's spiritual weapons, but he stands still not using them, nor fighting with them. These weapons are available, but one must fight. God's weapons have their power, but unless you use them, you will be defeated. There are some persons whom St. Paul mentions even weeping in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. Those could have used such weapons, but because they neglected them, deviated toward sin and submitted to it, they perished in their sins. We notice here also that among such spiritual weapons are righteousness, truth, the word of God, prayer, and supplication, being watchful, which are all works. St. Peter, the apostle, also speaks about this spiritual war. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9 through 9. The devil, our adversary, is like a roaring lion. What should we do then? St. Peter says, resist him. In other words, strive, be firm, and be brave, but do not depend on your human arm, power. You ought rather to resist him steadfast in the faith. This verse includes both sides, striving in resisting the devil, and grace upon which depends one who strives through faith. It is the striving which St. Paul the Apostle calls for while rebuking the Hebrews, for he says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Here striving and resistance are required, but we should resist by God's whole armor, not by our own power, and we should be steadfast in the faith. Thus, St. Paul the Apostle says to his disciple St. Timothy, Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Here he requires both matters, striving and faith, and both go together. St. Paul speaks again about his own striving. He says, We are bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. And in his gospel to the Colossians, he says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you. The example of David and Goliath. How did David defeat Goliath? Was this through God's grace and help? Certainly, yes. David depended wholly on God, so he said to Goliath, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45-47 through 47. The greatness of David in this battle appears in that he brought God into the field of the battle. Before David came, there had been no mention of God, only talk about the man who had come up, the valiant who defied the army, and about the prize of the king to the person who would kill that man. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 25. David brought the Lord's name into the battle, as we see from his words. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion. The battle is the Lord's, etc. But was David satisfied with introducing the name of the Lord into the battlefield? Did he depend on that, saying, Through faith I shall kill Goliath? without labor or striving. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give him into our hands. No. But David chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. Then as Goliath drew near to meet David, it was so that, David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. 
So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it of its sheath and killed him, and cut off his head with it. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 48 through 51. It is true indeed that the battle is the Lord's. In this example, it was the Lord who delivered Goliath into the hand of David. But David had to fight, to hasten and run toward the enemy, to choose certain stones, to put the stones in the sling, and to strike skillfully. He had also to draw his sword of its sheath and prevail over the Philistine and kill him. All these steps are works. However, we ascribe the victory to God, not to David. Because the stone might have missed the deadly point, and Goliath might have not died from it. So although David fought very skillfully and conquered, yet we say along with St. Paul the Apostle, It is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Romans chapter 9 verse 16 There must be striving and labor, but at the end, victory is to be ascribed to God. Faith and works together the same is to be said of the spiritual striving. Undoubtedly, it is a battle likewise. You fight with all your power, but the power you have is God's power. You fight with every weapon you have, but this weapon is God's whole armor. On the other hand, do not say, I shall sleep and dream, for in my dreams I see God's grace saving me. God does not save the sluggard, and the grace does not encourage slackness and permissiveness. Suppose that a pupil does not study, but he goes to the priest, asking his prayers for him to succeed, trusting in the power of prayers. What do you say of that? The rule is, faith without works is dead. A pupil has to study and to ask for prayers. Thus faith and works go together in unity. Some would say that striving represents the human arm, power, while it is said, Cursed is the man who makes flesh his strength. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. In fact, striving becomes a human power if a person depends on himself alone. In other words, if he thinks that he can be saved by his own striving without the work of grace. At this point, he is faced with the words of the Lord, Without me, you can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. Fighting can never be without a weapon, and a weapon by itself without fighting and without a person to use it skillfully cannot bring victory. Both are inseparable, as St. Paul the Apostle says. If anyone competes, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Thus, you have to strive, and your striving be according to the rules, so that you may be saved. The Striving of the Apostles and Pastors Did not the apostles strive and labor for faith? Nay, for St. Paul the Apostle himself says, I labored more abundantly than they all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 All the apostles labored and St. Paul labored more. He even recorded his labors in the second epistle to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 33 If it were merely a question of grace, why then would St. Paul labor? What would be the necessity of evangelizing? preaching, giving advices, serving the word of God, pastoral work, and labor as long as grace was to do everything. Why should a pastor labor, perform his pastoral duties, look after people, and strive? Is not God able to speak in the hearts of people and save them alone? What need is there for apostles, pastors, and preachers? What need is there for any striving? Do we call all this human power, arm? Would grace do everything alone? A priest then might sleep and pray in his heart to the Lord, saying, O Lord, it is you who look after your people and take care of them. Who am I to strive and look after them? It is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of you who care for the people. As for preachers also, why should a preacher give a sermon? He can lie resting at home and say, O Lord, it is your grace that speaks in the hearts of the people. Guide them and save them. You also, why do you labor in your life, whether in prayers, in fasting, or in striving? Rest then, depending on grace to do everything. Working with God 
We say all this because many people are lost because they followed a wrong counsel said by others, which is, do not strive. Why should you strive? God will not begin to work for you except when you stop working. Stop working then so that God may work. What strange deadly words are these? How can it be that you stop work in order to let God work? Why do you not work with God so he works with you, works within you, and works through you, as St. Paul said about himself and Apollos? For we are God's fellow workers. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 Why do we separate our work from God's work? Why do we not be fellow workers with him, to work with him and he with us? So as St. John the Apostle speaks about the Lord and the fellowship with him, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, and St. Paul speaks about the community of the Holy Spirit. God, with his grace, with his power, and with his Holy Spirit says to you, I want to work with you to save you. If you accept to work with me, you will be saved. But if you do not accept, you will deprive yourself of such salvation. I stand knocking at the door, offering my grace, my love, my strength, my help, and all the powers necessary for the salvation of the soul at which door I am knocking. But if anyone opens for me, if he accepts to work with me, if he gives up himself to me to work in, if he submits to my work, then I shall co-work with him and he with me. The Extravagant Point of View the worst of what I read throughout my life concerning extravagance and denying the value of works is what F. B. Mayer wrote in his book entitled, Saved and Preserved. Even the most fanatic protestants who fight striving say that a person has to strive in one field only, i.e., striving in prayers, but F. B. Mayer fights even the striving in prayers. Under the title, When I Stopped My Efforts, he says, you have to realize a fact, that as long as you wrestle with God, you will lose the most valuable blessings. Jacob wrestled with God all night until the breaking of day, but did not advance even one step. But when he became no more able to wrestle, because the socket of his hip was out of joint and was about to fall, he received the blessing that made him head. Genesis 32, 24-29 Mayer goes on saying, you have moaned and struggled and implored but in vain. Now you have to stop and keep silent. Your tremendous efforts complicated your affairs more. And this protestant writer goes on fighting prayers, striving, imploring, and wrestling with God till he says, Know that God is able to save you. He is waiting all this long time to save you, and when you stop your labor, he will begin. In this way, he calls people to stop running and working. In another chapter entitled, We do not seek, but we receive, he says, You will not get the blessing you long for by struggling and striving, by your cries and prayers, nor by your determination and attempts, but rather by calming yourself down before God and accepting grace. He gives an example of the ineffectiveness of striving and prayers, the story of a person who struggled for two years raising prayers to God to grant him power to overcome a certain temptation. It seemed that the prayers were not accepted, and he became very desperate. But when he stopped prayers, God began to work. Does this teaching satisfy anyone's conscience? The Holy Bible itself in all the scriptures calls us to strive in prayers, to pray unceasingly, and to keep watch and pray. But it is the protestant extravagance that denies the value of striving even in prayers. Spiritual Exercises the Protestants and any others like them who fight striving and works fight also spiritual exercises as if these also mean dependence on human arm, power. But we say that only if a person proceeds with his spiritual exercises, depending on his own power, he will certainly be mistaken. It is good for a person to practice, but he should depend on God's power and say along with St. Paul the Apostle, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Also, speaking about his own exercises, St. Paul the Apostle says, This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Acts chapter 24 verse 16. And in his epistle to the Philippians, he says, 
Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Philippians chapter 4 verse 12. He had become trained and had his senses exercised. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. It is good then for a believer to have spiritual exercises and can even pray to God saying, Lead me in your truth and teach me. Psalm 25 verse 5. But in all these exercises, he has to depend on God's power, which gives him help, and in every success he has to ascribe the merit to God, not to his own courage or self-control.